I have a question about love. And one of the experiences that I have in connection when I feel like I'm in, a, in alignment with what you're calling the evolutionary impulse is this amazing love and sense of connection to my world um, that encourages me. It takes up the space in between things and encourages me when I get frustrated or scared. Um, and I just wondered if you could speak about love. You spoke of peace and this um, ecstasy and this urgency. And I'm wondering about love. Um, love is, remember we talked about those qualities that when spirit manifests, the different contemplative traditions give it, like being, consciousness, bliss, joy, happiness, love. Love is one of the biggies that um, is a quality of manifest spirit, spirit entering the world of space-time, spirit in action. And you can experience love in, as, you be, as you wake up, and as you establish a relationship to your own higher self, to your own self-liberating awareness, your own spiritual awareness. You can start to feel love, and many, many people do feel an enormous amount of love emerging from their heart. And they feel gratitude and they feel gratefulness. And it's, um, these are all emotions, in a sense, that you can describe as coming to the ego on its way out. Um, but nonetheless, something that it can feel as it's going, oh, bye-bye, oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh. <sighs> Um, but these are emotions that can be felt as the self-contraction, the separate self-sense, the ego, is released into its own fuller self, which is a manifestation of spirit itself and spirit in action. And eros manifesting in your own awareness. And I think it's, it, it's, it's sort of important uh, to realize that Eros goes all the way back. It's part of, in the aqua framework, the four quadrants and levels, lines, states, types go all the way down, meaning they were there, present from the beginning. And the drives that, that each holon has, there are four major drives. On the same level that a holon's on, it has agency, which is the drive to its own autonomy, and communion, which is the drive to itself being part of a relationship, and agape, which is when it reaches down and embraces all of its lower levels. So a cell embraces a molecule, embraces an atom, embraces a quark, that's agape. And then it reaches up to creating higher levels. And that's Eros. And agape definitely can be felt as what we just generically call love. But Eros can be felt as what's generically called love um, as well. And that drive towards greater union is one of the most astonishing things about Eros and actually one of the most astonishing things about the universe itself. I mean, it, you think about it, there, at one point in history, there was nothing but atoms wandering around. And one day, several atoms got together, and they're just kind of sitting there, you know, having like a little party. That, and all of a sudden, a single membrane drops around them and they form a single molecule. All of these atoms become one molecule. Now that's really astonishing that the universe would do this. Um, the notion that this is some sort of chance and um, random mutation, it, it, that's exactly what it isn't. It's exactly the opposite of chance or randomness. It's something occurring that's pushing against randomness in the universe. And then if that's not astonishing enough, the real kicker is 
dozens of these types of molecules, each a different type, each playing a different role, got together for the next tea party. And they're hanging out, and, you know, kind of booking and dancing and shit like that. All of a sudden, a membrane drops around them, and a single cell emerges. And more than that, it's alive. It can reproduce. The fact that that can happen is a miracle. It, it, it's just unbelievable that that can happen. Cells wandered around for a long time. They got together. Pow! Another single boundary dropped around them. Single cell organisms. And plant life emerges. And then on and on and on with, with extra additions being added as you move from plant life into locomotive life and the emergence of animals. And then animals get more and more complex as a neural net drops down and emerges. And then a reptilian brain stem. And then a, a limbic system. And then a paleomammalian brain stem. And then a cortex. And there's something new with humans. A neocortex. All of this driven by love. <clears throat> and the philosophers throughout history have referred to it by many names. Eros is one of the most common. Um, this is a, an extraordinarily driven process. Eric Jans referred to evolution as self organization through self-transcendence, which is as good as any to think about it. Because when it shows up in human beings, Eros shows up in increasingly higher levels of unity in consciousness. In other words, consciousness goes from just being egocentric and caring only about itself, then it moves to ethnocentric care. Because in noticing somebody outside of your own egocentric self, you can start to care for them. Then world-centric, move from care to universal care. And that means that you then care about human beings, all human beings, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. So you can start to feel a love for humanity, a love for your identity with all human beings. And then to move into cosmocentric is to, is to find an identity with and a love with all sentient beings. And so love is this um, embracing emotion of reaching out and finding wider and wider and wider and greater and greater and greater unities where you are transcending yourself more and more and more and more and more. And there is more authentic self, less ego, more authentic self, less ego, until there's a, a dramatic self-liberation and self-realization where you realize the supreme identity, as the Sufis call it, which is this radical oneness with non-duality itself, the world of suchness. Um, and so there's a spectrum of love. And so that love of all manifestation is a love that reaches all the way back to the Big Bang. It's that drive that goes all the way back that far and was pulling things together into higher and higher unities 14 billion years ago. And never gave up. And the thing that Andrew and I are, are most kind of astonished by is that this evolutionary impulse, this eros, is still operating and still driving us towards these greater realizations. And so to actual feel eros, to become one with that urgent, innovative, creative drive that Andrew talks about is an intrinsic part of the spiritual process, of a true non-dual evolutionary integral spiritual process. 
I just wanted to, that was beautiful. I wanted to just add a, a, a few things to that, which is more with uh, looking at what this actually means for us, what it actually means for us. So um, I think the implications of the experience of love are very profound. They're, they're very profound, and especially in an enlightenment context, the awakening to, to what we could call spiritual love actually does threaten the, the status quo, the status quo of our personal separate self, and also our culturally shared status quo. And this, so, so I think that uh, often uh, people in spiritual context use love in a way that makes everybody feel warm and fuzzy and a little bit, and, and, and I, I actually think my experience is that authentic spiritual love, which is the awakening to, to, to the, which is, which is a part of the process of awakening to that which is absolute or non-relative, absolutely threatens the status quo of ourselves. So real love uh, is, an ex is, is and always will be an ecstatic euphoria, uh, an ecstatic uh, uh, experience of euphoria. But if it's, but if it's, if it's, if, but if it's real spiritual love, it will, it, it, it will uh, compel us and challenge us uh, to, to take a big step forward and upward. And that is threatening. That is a bullwhip in the temple. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so often when this word comes up, I mean, Ken, Ken was speaking about the difference between agape and eros, and I wanted to just describe a little bit about how, what I understand the difference between those, uh, between those two to be. But even before that, you know, just, just, you know, often people say, well, you know, I love spaghetti. I always start talking, okay, that's one kind of love. I love my dog. I really love my dog. So right, it's an authentic experience of, of love. I love my wife or my husband, my daughter or my child. Right, I love my wife and husband. Romantic and sexual love. I love my child. These are these are actual emotional experiences. They have different qualities. I love my friends. I love my community. I love my, etc. It goes on. <laughs> um, but when we awaken to these this deeper dimensions of these, these non-relative or absolute manifestations of love, uh, we begin to feel, there's a, there's a quality of feeling or emotion that's of a different order that transcends radically all of our lesser experiences of love. Now, the lesser experiences of love, I love my, you know, I love, I, I love my dog, I love my husband, my wife, my children, my community, also have part and parcel with them forms of attachment based upon usually less enlightened perspectives about who I am, what life is, where I am. It has to do with my identity. So the thing is, when we awaken to spiritual love authentically uh, and awaken to a deeper and more profound sense of self, identity, it actually will begin to affect in very direct, powerful, poignant, and sometimes shocking and even frightening ways uh, many, of the, many of the kinds of experiences or loves or notions of love that we had before, before we became enlightened by this, by this deeper experience of love, which might mean we, we begin to see through and, and no, longer, no longer feel so at one with the other, the others, in the way that we did before, because now we're seeing them from a higher perspective. And now we're experiencing a different kind of love. It's a kind of love that's not based upon attachment. It's not based upon historical experience. It's not based upon personal history. And, and suddenly we find that this, this kind of love begins to include more of the world, more of the universe, more of the cosmos. And it's a less exclusive kind of love. It's more inclusive. And so then, uh, the individuals maybe to whom we had these, the, these experiences of love and attachment earlier might feel that we don't love them anymore, when in fact we don't love them any less. We've just found a deeper source of love that's including a lot more of the universe, of the cosmos, the interior of the cosmos, of the world. And we've, now we find that we're maybe not loving individuals as much as we're loving consciousness. And when that begins to happen to us, this changes the way we relate to the world. It changes the quality of our relationship. It changes the way we think about what that word means. 
in a way that it really does change the status quo and compels us to really think about what it means to be a human being in a very different way that challenges all of our historical experience and all the historical imprints on the self up until that moment. So real spiritual love really does challenge the status quo of our self, whatever it may have been up until the present moment, in very profound and dramatic, and ways that are really evolutionary and inspiring and deeply inspiring. But the point is, if we really want to know what love is and we really want to be intoxicated with real spiritual love, we are going to have to be willing to relinquish our attachment to the way things have been. Things may change very dramatically. Maybe things won't change that much. But we have to be ready for the earth to shake, for an earthquake to happen. Because real love does create earthquakes. And what's happened afterwards is very different. So, so often the way we think about love is, is not that way. The other, other, other just the distinction between Eros and Agape, I think, uh, is important. And so it's, I mean, I, I've thought quite a lot about this, especially in relationship to more the traditional firms, forms of enlightenment versus the new evolutionary enlightenment. So what we'll find in the traditional notions of enlightenment, whether it's in the East and the West, uh, great, you know, we can see this in, in Hinduism and Buddhism, Buddhism and great Christian saints and ascetics, that there's usually two dimensions. One is the individual seeks for her, his or her own salvation through the practice of, of prayer, identification with the Godhead, and or awakening to, to non-dual singularity or emptiness. And, and, and one way or the other, when, there, when the individual wins his or her own liberation from, from ignorance uh, and suffering and unenlightenment and awakens to, to radical non-duality. But what we notice is that in, the, in more of the traditional versions of this, in the East and the West, the expression, the, the outward manifestation expression of that enlightenment, has to, usually it has to do with healing. Healing the suffering that exists in the world. And there are many great, there have been many great teachers and realizers historically, and there are many today deeply, powerfully, profoundly enlightened, deeply realized individuals who, uh, who express they're awakening their enlightenment through doing heroic work to heal the very real suffering that exists in the world. And so the, uh, so the expression of uh, agape has been a very traditional expression of, of, of enlightenment historically and still is today. But I think that when one awakens to Eros, so this aspiration to give rise to that which is new, there's a shift. And now we become less concerned with healing and more concerned with giving rise to creation, giving rise to that which is new. And, one, and my, one of the times I originally understood or recognized this was, um, was when I heard uh, the story about Jesus when, and I, I, the story goes something like, the, he was with his followers on the road, and I might be getting this wrong, so because I'm, but, uh, and I think there was a, a body that needed to be buried, and in Jewish, according to Jewish law, you have to bury the dead. It's, and he basically said, let the beg bury the dead. This is what we're doing is more important. And people, <gasps> but he was, but, he, but you see, when we become, when we awaken to the potential of, uh, to, to new emergent potentials that can and will happen if we keep going and we don't stop and we keep going and we don't stop, we, we become more concerned and more compelled with giving rise to the possible than we do with, with, with the process of healing uh, the very real suffering that exists. And so I, the experience of love as agape and the experience of love as arrows, and at least in my experience and understanding, is a different experience and expression and manifestation of what love is. And it's just very interesting. This is something just to keep in mind. There's, there's, a, love, there's a love for emergence, which is kind of, which is this, as we were speaking before, which is this very inspired reaching forth to give rise to, to, to allow something new to enter into the world. And there's another expression of, word, uh, of love, which is, which you know, with which deeply enlightened people are able to express in ways that most of us can't, which is which is a which is an unbelievable, a a, sh a shocking degree of care for for another's pain, that unless someone was a deeply enlightened or spiritually awakened person, one would simply would not be capable of. But I think it's just important to understand that spiritual love, being either agape and or eros, is not the same thing, and it's we and with the, what it's the experience of that kind of love. Is different, and it's just so important to be aware of that. So, in your own experience, we can make these distinctions. When you become overwhelmed by the euphoria of love, to realize that it's not all the same. 